this morning. That was so precious and meaningful. I walked into the chapel this morning with a student who said, it's been a tough morning already. And I said, you just wait. After chapel today, I think your spirit will be lifted up high, and mine certainly is. Thank you for coming and being a part of this worship experience today. Thank you, too, for last week. Last week was a lot of fun. Our spirit week, our heritage week, leading up to a really neat homecoming week. You know, there were 1,911 people that came and saw smoke on the mountain. And uh, our students did an absolutely fantastic job with that. And uh, backed by popular demand, we might ask them to do it again this weekend. We'll see if they say yes. What was so special about homecoming this weekend was to see the hundreds of graduates coming mo a lot from the past five years of graduating classes and telling so many people what this place means to them. And all of you are a part of that right now in this moment of time. And we thank the Lord for each one of you students and pray this will be a great week for you at LBC. We figured out something, and that is how could we do better in chapel than we did last week, hearing from four of our graduates. And the only plan we could come up with was to hear from members of our board of trustees. So this week, starting this morning, we are going to hear from three of the trustees of Lancaster Bible College. The trustees are the men and women who hold in trust the mission of Lancaster Bible College. These are the men and women who set the direction for LBC. And colleges and universities rise or fall on the caliber of their trustees. And today, students, I'm thankful to report that uh, God, in his infinite grace and love, has blessed us with a group of committed men and women who understand biblical higher education and they oversee this great enterprise we call LBC. It's my personal pleasure and professional privilege at this time to introduce a dear friend and a colleague, an LBC trustee, Ms. Tracy Jones. Tracy is the daughter of Charles and Gloria Jones, for whom our library is named. Her father, Charlie Tremendous Jones was known worldwide as an author and motivational speaker until his death in the year 2008. Charlie Tremendous Jones stood here many times and challenged our students to make their lives count for God. LBC had a marvelous part in his spiritual formation when he was a very young man. Tracy is one of six children, and uh, we have recently been grieving with her family when her brother Jerry, just a couple of weeks ago, passed away at age 66. Tracy is an Air Force veteran and holds an MBA in global management. In 2009, she came back to the area and took the helm of Tremendous Life Books, a company founded by her father, known for publishing books on leadership and motivation. I thought you should know that Tracy was the 2013 recipient of the prestigious Women of Influence Award given by the Central Penn Business Journal right here in South Central Pennsylvania. Her newest book, just released, is titled Beyond Tremendous, Raising the Bar on Life. Tracy has been a member of our Board of Trustees since 2010, and it was Tracy who chaired our capital campaign for the TAG Learning Commons, which was completed in 2012. Tracy has just entered her Ph.D. studies at LBC. She is a deep lady 
extremely well read. She possesses an incredible intellect, and we are blessed to be able to present her to you students today. Will you please join me in giving Tracy Jones a warm LBC we welcome. That intro like that, I'm even impressed to meet myself. That was incredible. My goodness. It makes me feel tremendous. How's everybody doing? Tremendous, right? You can't, you gotta be here. I gotta, I think I get my pay gets docked if I don't say tremendous. Well, thank you so much uh, for being here. I, I heard we're live streaming. I feel so hip and so cool with all you guys. And I love the fact that I'm here with my um, fellow students. We're all part of the uh, educational army here learning at Lancaster Bible College. And I'm actually in week five of my program. So I was sitting there last night and I said, okay, five weeks done, or 4.2 done out of 182 weeks. Okay, what percentage is that? And I'm like, okay, 2.3%. So that was, that was okay, but not very encouraging. So I said, okay, let's look at it. Let's look at it in months. And I'm like, okay, one month down out of 46. What percentage is that, right? 2.3, the exact same thing. So it's a good thing I'm, I'm studying leadership and not like statistical research because uh, I'm afraid I wouldn't have done too well with that. So today, in the brief time that we have together, I want to talk about um, some of the experiences that I have had in my professional career. And today, the title that we're going to share today is Job Description from Heaven, okay? So as you go out, in the world, you're going to have all these things called these J-O-Bs, and you're going to have a lot of different opportunities, and you're going to find different things that you're going to want to do or maybe not want to do after you start doing them, and you're going to have a lot of seasons in your life as things change. Today, we're going to talk about occupational health done right, and those of you that have worked in any kind of industry, if you heard of OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, that's to protect your body. Okay, but we don't need to focus on protecting your body, right? We're all going to get new, new ones anyways, correct? So today we're going to talk about your occupational health done right. And what I'm going to talk about is your spirit and your soul. This is going to be occupational health for your soul. So throughout my various careers, there are five times in my life, and I am not a, in ministry full-time. I'm a lay person. So a lot of people are Christian professionals. They're full-time ministry. I've been in the secular world my entire life. Uh, as opposed to a professional Christian, I am a, a Christian professional. So remember, business people need to hear the gospel too. So I've been out there kind of dealing with them and that, and that type thing. But five times in my life, I have had the opportunity to get the proverbial dream job. Not once, not twice, not three times, not four. Five times I got my, my, my dream job. This is what everybody wants, right? Your dream job. And then four times... I had the uh, privilege, and for those of you that have done, known how to do this, to put my two-week notice in, okay? So what started out as what I thought was my dream job, eventually, throughout some times in my life, I found out, hey, it is time to move on. So here's this thing called this J-O-B. You know, you guys have all heard it, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is the greatest job. They told me this is the greatest job, and I'm going to love it here. And then after maybe six months or a year or two years, inevitably, I would get to that wall and I'd be like, this isn't what I thought. This isn't what they told me. Can I get an amen? Anybody ever been through that? Okay. This is completely normal. If you read the Bible and everything. So at first I thought, okay, this is a problem. So understand if you go out there and you got this J-O-B and you're thinking, oh my goodness, this is not heaven. This is the opposite of heaven. Some of these people and some of these things I'm working with. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Just remember. The job description, that's the job. The job description is from heaven. And it says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. That's Matthew 5:48. And I remember thinking, how can I be perfect when I work with some of these devils? You don't know some of the people that I have to work with, okay? And so I'm sitting there thinking, Lord, what is going on? And he's like, Tracy, you need to be perfect. So today, I want to share in the brief time we have together that really every job is your dream job. Whether your boss is the most horrible thing in the world, whether your mission or your ministry is failing, every job that you take, every opportunity to serve, you are placed there by God. And we're gonna talk about ways that you can find perfection and make it your dream jobs, especially in the jobs that really are challenging. So today, 
Every good speech has three points, so I want to share with you three points about eternal job security. A lot of people are out there and they want job security. Well, let's talk about eternal job security. Let's talk about a job that no matter where we go, what industry, whether funding gets cut or not, we can have eternal job security. And first of all, the one thing you need to really look towards is that you are anxious to have exposure to experience. Are you willing to try new things? Are you willing to take a risk? Are you willing to expose yourself to new experiences? Are you willing to break out of the status quo? I like to say that to people. The status quo has got to go. All right, there is nothing biblical about remaining status quo. Second of all, do you engage with enthusiasm? All right, you know, I can remember my father, he would go to church when he was a young Christian and he'd see some of the Christians sitting there after he got saved and they'd be sitting there with a sour look on their face, wouldn't even smile, wouldn't make eye contact with their, with their lips sticking out and he would grab them by the collar literally and he would say, why don't you tell people you're an atheist and help us in reverse, okay? It's so important, I know you guys, I know, uh-huh. I'm not looking at anybody in particular, so, but you got to remember, engaging with enthusiasm, that's the hallmark of Christianity, even if you're working with a bunch of less than enthusiastic people. And trust me, there'll be times in your life when you will. Lastly, we need to execute with excellence. We do. We can't be responsible for everybody else on the team that isn't pulling their weight. And trust me, I'm sure everybody's been there, and you're going to go through this until you take your last breath. It is up to us. This is our attitude, these are our experiences, and this is our executing with excellence. So, getting started here, there's a, a story about a young student at Lancaster Bible College, and uh, this individual had asked their uh, very successful and spiritual pastor, uh, teacher, how they had gotten so successful. And the teacher told the young student, good judgment. And the young student said, okay, well, how do I get good judgment? And the elder pastor said, experience and the young student you know we want to know what's going on right now said okay well how do I get experience and the elder pastor said poor judgment okay so those of you that are laughing you understand the rest of you look kind of scared but don't worry I'm laying this heavy truth on you so you're not freaked out when it hit when it hits you one of the things I was taught growing up is that when we're born we have an empty keychain that is attached on our side and every experience that we go through in life good, bad, otherwise, whether we screwed something up or whether we did something really well, it gives us another key to put on the chain. So the more, and uh, uh, the beautiful thing is when you fail, and not fail intentionally, when you fail, you get double the keys, okay? Because everybody knows adversity is the best way to learn. So as you're going through life, the more experiences that you have, the more keys you get. And then as you go through life, as more things happen, you say, you don't get stressed out about that. I'm sure you meet some people that nothing absolutely can ruffle their feathers. They just have a wisdom and a seasoning. They've probably got a really full key ring of what's going on. When I grew up, my father told me, Tracy, you can't ride my coattails, because he, he was a pretty big figure, pretty large coattails. He says, you need to go out and earn your stripes. That's what he told me. And he wasn't military, but I thought, well, okay, I'll earn my stripes, I will go into the military. And one of the things I did is I went to Word of Life, if anybody's been there. He said, go up to Word of Life. And I worked at summer camp for a couple years. And then that led to me, um, you know, sure, I would have liked to have stayed around home and just lounged, but that was not an option for me. So I went to Word of Life, and then I actually got into the Word of Life Bible Institute for a year. Okay, so that, doing that, taking that experience, and then he went to, down to New Mexico Military Institute in Roswell, New Mexico, and he spoke there. Okay, this is before the aliens were there in Roswell, for those of you X-Files and sci-fi lovers. There weren't any aliens back then. And uh, we, would go, we would go down there, and he came back, and he said, Tracy, you may want to go here because these kids are really going to do something with their life. And they got me into the Air Force Academy. Okay, I had no idea that was going to happen. The other thing he had me do, he had me sell books door-to-door -door during my summers with Southwestern Book Company. Has anybody else done that? Anybody sold stuff door-to-door? -door? God bless you. Okay, God bless you. Some really, we need to talk then. And he would tell me, Tracy, he goes, when you go, if you go and can make a cold call on a door and make a sale, this is one of the hardest things in life you're ever going to have to do. And so me being 17, I'm like, okay, let's get the hard stuff out of the way early so I can have fun the rest of my life, right? That was my reasoning. And he said to me as I got, as, he says, Tracy, when you knock on the door, okay, 
when you knock on the door and they answer the door, don't put your foot in the door. Put your head through the door so when they go to slam it on you, you can keep talking. Okay? So these are the kind of experiences that he let me know. Okay? Uh, he let me know that the quickest way to success is to cram 50 years of failure into 15. Okay? Fail often. Fail early. Embrace it. And I'm not saying you go out there and try and mess up. You know what I'm talking about. But you're going to do your best. And all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. That's our fail safe. No matter what we mess up, if we do our best and are, are trying to honor God in it, he has a way. When I look back at my life, I did everything wrong. And somehow looking back now, he made everything turn out right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, the, and here's Napoleon Hill, okay? Napoleon Hill is a great personal development teacher. And he says, if you're not learning while you're earning, you're cheating yourself out of the better portion of your compensation. You're going to have jobs where you're sitting there and you're thinking, this is ridiculous. I don't like this. This isn't what I signed up for. That doesn't matter. That's where you learn the best. Okay? You don't want to hear all my stories about how everything went right. I don't have that many. And the war stories are a lot more fun and humorous. Okay? You want to go out there for every mission, for everything you work with, for every church, for everything you go. You want to make sure that you're out there and learning. Okay? Because this is where you get the keys. And you want to grab as many keys as you can because... The paycheck is one thing, but this is no matter where you go. And all those jobs I left, I don't have any regrets about it. The stuff I learned was incredible. And yes, they paid me, but what I, what I kept took from them was the unbelievable em embracing of experiences that I learned. So I want to talk real quick about the price of perfection. So God tells us he wants to be perfect even as he is perfect. Okay, and people think, oh, my life is perfect. That's a good thing. Okay, the price of perfection is a heavy one to pay. All right. For us to achieve perfection, God has to break us down to build us up. When I was in the military, that was one of those things, too. You get broken down until there's no individual identity, so you can get lifted up and built up together as a team. And it's the same thing in the Christian faith. And when you pursue perfection, it's going to be a lonely path, right? Because God has to work on you and only you and make sure that you are relying on nobody else, not your boss, not your team members, not your corporate holidays, none of that. He has to get you alone. Following per perfection in your job is also weary. It's tiring. It takes a lot of effort. It doesn't come naturally to us. And also, there's a lot of times to achieve perfection in the job, you're going to have to abandon. You're going to have to abandon maybe what other people think of you. You're going to have to abandon to give yourself wholeheartedly to what you're supposed to be doing and accomplishing this particular mission. And lastly... Perfection means vision, and I don't mean like a Steve Jobs or a Walt Disney where you're like some crazy visionary or like Dr. Tag, really super smart kind of thing. Vision is just seeing what needs to be done and doing it, okay? So really, as long as you're doing what needs to be done, we are all absolute visionaries. One of the things that I start my day every morning with is Oswald Chambers, My Utmost for His Highest. We got anybody else that reads that? I just absolutely adore it. June 25th is one of my favorites, and he talks about receiving yourself in the fires of sorrow. And he references Jesus crying out in John 12, 27 and 28, and he says, What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. So as you go out into these different occupations, you're going to feel like, Oh my gosh, I have just gone into the fire, just like Christ did, Okay. But Oswald Chambers goes on to say, suffering either gives me to myself or it destroys me. The only way to find yourself is in the fires of sorrow. Christ was saved not from the hour, but out of the hour. And when I look back at some of the experiences that I had, where I earned my stripes and I got my scars, I was not saved from the hour, but I was saved out of the hour. And that's such an absolute important distinction. Whenever somebody will say to me, oh, leadership, I got this down. Leadership is easy. I want to say to them, then you're doing it wrong. Okay? Leadership is anything, anything but easy. First Thessalonians 3, 4 states, In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that you would be persecuted. And it turned out that way, as you well know. I want to take these people that are sharing the gospel of prosperity and say, my friends, it's the gospel of adversity. Okay? It is war on here. All right? And we're going to be challenged at every path to take it. John 15, 18, and 19. 
If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of this world, but I chose you out of this world, because of this, the world hates you. And I wish I would have kept this at heart earlier when I was going through some of the trials and stuff. When you go into different organizations, sometimes even Christian organizations, the price of perfection is going to set you apart. All right. And even if you look at the New Testament, who did Jesus get the most blowback from? The religious leaders who should have known better. The ones who were adhering and upholding the law. So just remember going through. If you encounter this, the price of perfection, don't think, oh, no, I'm doing it wrong. God's punishing me. This is the price you pay for following that job description from heaven. All right, so I want to talk a little bit. Now we talked about experiences and everybody's ready. Whatever bad thing that happens this week, rejoice. Because if you're going through the fire, know you're being made for something else. Winston Churchill has one of my favorite quotes. If you're going through hell, keep going. Okay, because you're going to come out on the other side and you're going to be something different. So let me talk about enthusiasm with not so perfect attitudes. My father used to tell me my problem isn't how to motivate other people. It's how to keep other people from demotivating me. Huh? How about that? I love life. But boy, sometimes it's the people that really get to me. All right. If I had my way with just my dogs and my books and my garden and just that life would truly be heaven on earth. Okay, but we have to get out there and we have to really make sure that we stay happy. And my father would say, life is tough for everybody. Everybody's miserable. Even the successful rich people, successful in the ministry, mega pastors, everybody's miserable. But there's one of two choices. You can be miserable, miserable, or you can be happy, miserable. Okay, and guess if we're pursuing perfection, what we're supposed to be doing. Happy, miserable. So that is the choice we need to make. So I want to tell a little bit about uh, positive attitude. I really like this quote here, Herm Albright. A positive attitude may not solve all your problems, but it will enough, annoy enough people to make it worth the effort. Okay? Right? Now, we don't do that, but it is kind of funny. And i got to tell you something. I once got written up for my positive attitude. It's a good thing I didn't tell the doctoral candidacy board that because I might not be standing here today. But what it was is I had, they said I was too passionate, too enthusiastic about my job. What they meant was doing the right thing. Okay? Yes, I was very passionate and enthusiastic about doing the right thing. So remember, when you're going out there and you're promoting this, that might rub some people absolutely the wrong way. So it's very important to remember that you want to be happy, miserable, and not like everybody else, miserable, miserable. So Zig Ziglar, he's a great motivational speaker. I love reading his stuff. He has this thing called SNIOP. And it means sensitive to the negative influences of other people. Are you a SNIOP? And you know what? The older I get and the more spiritually mature I get, holy cow, I get more, more sensitive to it. I used to, when I was younger, when I was you guys, I had a high threshold for it. But now I just can't handle this negativity. It just brings me down. It makes me, it just gets, brings out a very unperfect side of me. So I want to share a story about a lady that was getting her hair done. And she went to her hairdresser. And the hairdresser says, well, what do you got planned coming up? And the lady said, well, my husband and I are taking a trip to Rome. And the hairdresser said, ew, Rome? That place is dirty. The exchange rate is terrible. And they don't like Americans. You're going to have a rotten time there. And the lady said, and the hairdresser said, well, what airline are you flying? And the lady said, Continental. And she was, Continental? Those planes are old. They're never on time. You'll be lucky if you don't get stranded in some third world country. And then the lady said, well, where are you going to stay when you get there? And the lady said, well, we're going to stay down by the Tiber River at this one historic location. And the hairdresser says, I know the place. I've seen it on kayak.com. It's a dump. Everybody thinks it's going to be full of all these antiquities, and it's going to be just, just divine. And it's terrible. And the hairdresser says, well, what are you going to do when you're there? And the lady says, well, we're going to try and see the Pope. And the hairdresser says, yeah, you and everybody else. He's going to look like a little tiny ant. You're not even going to be able to see him from, uh, from where you're at. So off the lady goes. And about a month later, she comes back to the hairdresser. And the hairdresser says, how was the trip? And the lady said, you're not going to believe it, how tremendous it was. And the hairdresser says, well, what do you mean? She goes, Continental just upgraded their fleet. We were in a brand new plane. They overbooked it. We were bumped up to first class. We had drinks and foot massages and stewards waiting on his hand. It was incredible. And the hairdresser goes, okay, well, how was the place you stayed at? And the lady said, you're not going to believe it. They just did a $15 million renovation, 
And it was one of the most incredible places that I have ever stayed. I just love it. And the hairdresser was like, okay, well, what about the Pope? I bet you didn't get to see him. And the lady said, you are, this is the part you're really not going to believe. She said, while we were standing there, two of his um, secret service people came and tapped us on the shoulder and said, would you come over here separate? The Pope would like to meet some visitors from America after he's done giving his mass. And so the lady said, so we went over this private room and we were just sitting there quietly on the chairs and all of a sudden the door opened and the Pope came out and I was looking at the Pope and he took my hand and he bowed his head and he whispered in my ear. And the hairdresser was incredulous. She's like, you are kidding me. What did he say to you? And the lady answered, he said, who gave you that lousy hairdo? Okay. So. That's one way to shut the naysayers up, but that's not really scriptural. But just remember, when you are going through this, you got to ask yourselves, am I a fountain or a drain? Okay? When you're with people, do you feel like you're taking? Do you feel enriched? Or when you leave certain people, do you feel absolute, absolutely depleted? Be very spiritually aware of this. You know, they say some people brighten a room when they come in. Other people brighten a room when they leave. Okay, you want to make sure that you are one of those that brightens the room when you come in. Okay, so my dogs wrote books. Okay, no, you're not sleeping. You heard it right. Okay, my dogs wrote books. And hopefully they'll be here. I know, you can't believe it. They're best smelling pothers. And they're very, 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 very smart. Okay, they're very smart. One of the things my dog, Mr. Blue, who has since left this world, and uh, if you believe what C.S. Lewis says, I will see him again in, in heaven, but we're not going to go into that theology right now about pets in heaven. But anyways, he was the most calm spirit in the whole world. He was so mellow. But when Mr. Blue, when I would just go to the drawer, the, um, the door where the vacuum cleaner was, Mr. Blue would go crazy like a Tasmanian devil. And one time, any of you guys got dogs and they go crazy over the vacuums? It's like, what, what on earth is going on? You already cleaned off the floor. There's, we're not fighting for crumbs. You already got the crumbs. And Mr. Blue would just go crazy. He bit the vacuum so hard, my sweet, sweet soul dog bit the vacuum so hard he broke his tooth. Okay? So what he did is he wrote one of his chapters of his book of True Blue Leadership. It's called Dealing with Life's Vacuum Cleaners. And the vacuum cleaners are life are the people that kick up a bunch of dirt and blow a bunch of hot air and make a bunch of noise, okay? And in the end, it's got nothing to do with you. They just want to get you hot under the collar. So when you run into these hoovers in your life, you need to just unplug them, okay? And you need to silence them and silence. The other thing is you got your hoover going on up here. We do enough negative self-talk on our own selves, so remember that. I want to tell you one other thing. Your I will is more important than your IQ. I once landed a job in, in working for the NSA where I was running a secure classified facility. And they were like, well, Tracy, you need two years of experience before you can come and do this job. And I said, all right. They said, but we will bring you in in the interim. And you just do the interim project manager. And then two years after that, we'll appoint you as a regular project manager. So I said, okay, I'll try it. So I got in there, and about six weeks later, the government called me and said, hey, come on up to our office. So up I went, and they said, hey, we decided to waive that two-year thing. And I said, well, well, wait a minute. This is the government. It's all about rules and regulations. They said, yeah, but you were so enthusiastic and willing to jump in. We knew it was going to be okay. All right? And that's why I say your I will is more important than your IQ. I have worked with scientists. I have worked with people that have done PhDs, that have put things on Mars and stuff. I work with people that forget in a day more than I'll ever know. Okay? But if you don't have a personality where you're willing to be a part of the team, you're basically useless. So remember, your attitude and that reflection of Christ and you're willing to be a part of the team is the most important thing of all. I like the thing, are you a thermostat or are you a thermometer? A thermostat just reflects what's going on around them. If I'm with a yucky group of people or I'm in a class I hate or a job that's cold, I'm going to be just as cold and yucky and mean as that. Are you a thermostat? Do you go into the organization and turn it up? Okay, do you create the atmosphere? And that's something to really always remember. Who's in your nest? Birds of a feather flock together, right? The quality of your life depends on the quality of your thoughts and your friends. And this includes on social media too, folks more so than ever.
okay? You need to make sure that who you hang out with, you know, there are some motivational books that say that you are actually a compilation of the five people that you hang out with the most, that, that you kind of all assimilate. So you want to make sure that you got some really choice cuts in there, right? If you're the smartest person in your group, you're in the wrong group, okay? You want to keep, you want to keep lifting up. And my father used to tell me this, Tracy said, hang around thinkers, you'll be a better thinker. Hang around achievers, you'll be a better achiever. Hang around givers, you'll be a better giver. Hang around a bunch of thumb-sucking, complaining, riping boneheads, and you'll be a better thumb-sucking, complaining, riping bonehead. <laughs> Need I say more? It pretty much says it. Just make sure, in perfection, you need to stay away from some of the toxicity. Okay? Now, lastly, engaging with excellence. Aristotle has a quote. And he says, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. And a lot of people think, well, I'm just not born excellent. I'm not born like a King David or a Solomon. Excellence is all about your habits. You show me what you're doing in your spare time and what you're reading, and I'll tell you exactly where you're going to be in five years. It's all about your habits. And my father would tell me, don't try to get a better job. Do a better job. Do a better job, and you will have a better job. A lot of us sit there and say, well, I'm not getting what I'm worth. My friend, you better be glad you're not getting what you're worth, okay? The more you sit here and you do excellence, that's when, and even if you don't stay with those jobs, I, I work my tail off. And uh, <laughs> I work my tail off, and that was good. I, I developed excellence. I have no regrets about it, all right? So you need to also find excellent. You guys will really like this. Okay. And you're, okay. So in one of the chapters in my book is, does this excuse make my butt look big? Okay. People that sit there and make excuse after excuse after excuse. This is very, very difficult for me. And there's a story about Bob and Joe. Bob and Joe are two construction workers. Okay. Every day they sit down and they have lunch together. Every day Bob opens his lunch pail and he pulls out a peanut butter sandwich. And he looks at Joe and he says, Oh, no, not peanut butter and jelly. This goes on day after day, every day. Oh, no, not another peanut butter sandwich. Well, finally, one day, Bob is so incensed, he looks up to God Almighty. He says, dear Lord, no, not another peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And Joe says to him, Bob, why don't you tell your wife you don't like peanut butter sandwiches? And Bob says, you leave my wife out of this. I pack my own lunch. All right? So what are you packing in your lunch? All right? Albert Einstein says the difference of an insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Okay? We need to execute with excellent habits. All right? And I love this one here. You can't leave footprints in the sand of time if you're sitting on your butt. And who wants to leave butt prints in the sand of time? Okay? Get up. Get up. God does not like us to be lazy. I tell people I am slacktose intolerant. Okay? I do not like this. Okay? And you should not like it either. Okay? You get a lot of people that think, well, we're in the ministry, or I'm just volunteering my time. Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. Everybody has to be providing themselves and working to a habit of excellence. One of my favorite books is The Common Denominator of Success. It states that the only difference between a failure and a success is that a success has made a habit out of doing things that failures don't like to do. It's all about your habits. This is Pablo Picasso's picture, famous work of art called The Bull. And what he did, you can see where he started painting it, in the upper left-hand corner, and he went all the way down the left-hand side and go to the top of the right all the way down until that final picture, that's his masterpiece. And so much of our life, when we are executed with excellence, we need to deconstruct the bull, okay? We need to cut out what of our life that is not perfect. He got down to the bare essential of what he needed to provide. So you eliminate the unperfect. One of my favorite things about being in this program, and when I interviewed, they said, well, Tracy, you know this is a terminal program. And I'm like, terminal? And I started laughing. I'm like, I'm terminal, okay? So this has been incredible because I have gotten to go into my life and say, hey, listen, I don't have time. People come in, well, can we meet and talk about what you do? Nope, I'm terminal. I don't got time for that, okay? If it's not something that contributes to your uh, mission, in the, in the military, we would call it queep or administrivia or like a time suck, something that just takes away from you focusing on what you need to do with the mission. And right here, you need to remember, as you're going through your life and deciding, you only got so many hours and so many days, I need to focus on what's gonna be, make me more perfect. How can you do the most good 
And number two, what are you most passionate about? I promise you, if you focus on those two things, you are going to be able to eliminate a lot of the other stuff. And it's not that you're being mean or mad. It's just that you have a, a gifting and man-made talents, and you have something that you need to go on and you need to start doing. So just to wrap it up, we are a reflection of Christ in all we do. Forget the job. It's not, nothing to do with the job. It's all about us and what we bring to the table, and what we bring to the table is a reflection of Christ in all we do. The dogs like this story. There's a little parable, a Japanese parable, about a little dog, and he climbs up a mountain, and he goes into this temple, and there's a thousand mirrors all over. And this is a very happy little dog. And he looks in all those mirrors, and he sees a thousand little happy faces and wagon tails looking back at him. And he thinks to himself, this is the greatest place I've ever been. I can't wait to go get all my doggy buddies and come back here. The next day, a mean, grumpy, snarly dog climbs up to the temple. And he goes in there, and he looks at the 10,000 mirrors. And he sees a thousand mean, snarling, grumpy, nasty dogs. Okay? And he thinks to himself, I'm never coming back here. This is the worst place on earth. So what changed? Did the job change? Did the environment change? It's all about your attitude. And so when you get into all these different opportunities, you guys have so many years of so many different things that you're going to be taught and opportunities to serve. And some of you are going to get it right the first time. Other of you are going to be like me, where you're just trying different things. The Lord's closing different doors and open them to just kind of refine. And you're going to have a very varied tapestry. But just remember, Stephen Covey said this, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. All right? That's it. Just keep it on the main thing. And the main thing that we're supposed to focus on is reflecting Christ in everything that we do. So just in closing, we start out as an apprentice, and then we go to become a journeyman. And as we're in our occupational health for our soul, we want to be closer and more attuned with the master craftsman. And remember, every experience that you go through is put not to break you down, but it's to restore you to perfection. So every failure especially is there to make you more Christ-like and to sharpen you. And remember, everything that we're going through with these jobs and some of these people and some of these challenges, guys, this is the closest thing to hell we're ever going to know right now on earth. Everything else, there's nowhere to go but up. And lastly, the expression of Christian character is not in doing good, but manifesting God-like perfection. And just to wrap it up, I want to share one last quote with my father who said, God never made a job that would make a man, but he made any man who could make a job. And I hear a lot of talk about robots taking over everything. Right, okay, maybe some jobs, maybe some people, okay? But we make the job. And as Christians, when we follow that job description from heaven, that's what we bring to the table. And I hope today in the time that we had together that I was able to impart a few things uh, with you. And I'd like to wrap it up and close in prayer, if you would, because we are just, oh, it's high noon. It's high 10 o'clock. Our dearest Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for this student body, Lord. We are so excited about the paths that you're going to take them on. Thank you for the faculty. Thank you for the donors. Um, thank you for the many blessings that you've brought. And Lord, help us to always remember wherever you lead the college, the experiences that you bring us, you will see us through to manifest our, our, your image in all our interactions with the community. And Lord, we just praise you and thank you for this day and the ability to execute with excellence. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys so much. Thank you.